Hello Watch Enthusiasts and welcome to a new episode of Watch Chronicle Unscripted, a podcast available everywhere you might find one, including SoundCloud, Spotify, iTunes, and also as a video on YouTube if you'd rather watch it. In today's episode we have a very important theme, the new Rolex Submariner. Now Rolex chose to release its new watches this year as opposed to next year as it initially was going to after the cancellation of Baselworld earlier this year. And we've seen an awful lot of new pieces. The models which have been particularly noted have been the new Rolex Submariner, of course, being a dive watch and being the dive watch, you could say, for the industry. But there was also the release of several interesting Oyster Perpetuals, Datejusts, and Sky Dwellers to choose from, with some rather bright and an unusual colours to see. But the Submariner is the theme of today's podcast, because I think it's important to consider this watch beyond just reading the headlines, which you might be able to see on the Rolex website, or in any number of articles online. Now I actually wrote an article about this on watchchronicle.com, the place I urge you to go to find our podcasts and videos as well as our articles. And on our website I spoke about how the Submariner this year could be a very different release from in the past, given the way the collection was launched, but also in the way in which Rolex has addressed criticism and interest from fans and general buyers. And I'd like to speak about this a little bit differently in today's podcast, but if you want to read the full thing, do head over to the website. Today I'd like to speak about why this release is unique. It's unique in the history of the Rolex Submariner, and it shows a very different future for Rolex as well. But I will of course fill you in on the various details of the watch, which I think are most important for the future of Rolex. Before I begin, do remember to like, share and subscribe if you're watching this as a video on YouTube, or follow us on whichever podcast player you enjoy using. Also, this week's episode is sponsored by Arage, the maker of unique watches for those who relish detail and innovation at a sensible price. But more on that later. But for most enthusiasts and lovers of Rolex watches, the question is what has Rolex actually released as this new Submariner collection? Well, the very word collection is an important thing to consider here, because in the past Rolex hasn't released the whole Submariner collection in a single move. Instead, they've chosen to release the Submariner date, followed by the standard Submariner later. This was the case, for example, with the previous generation Ceramic Submariner, which came in 2010, or thereabouts, with the date version only in 2012, with the subsequent version being the no-date, the standard Submariner. But today they've chosen to release the whole collection. So they've released everything from the standard steel no-date Submariner all the way through to the solid gold versions, with the most noteworthy model, of course, being the new black and blue version in white gold with a blue bezel which is darker than previous blue dial and blue bezel submariners. Next it's worth considering what has changed amongst these submariners. Of course many people have spoken about this, but I think there are some aspects which people haven't taken note of and which are quite important for the overall look of the timepiece. Of course the watch has now grown from 40 to 41 millimeters, but this is largely irrelevant given the fact that we don't know from where to where this has been measured, whether it's from the narrowest point between where the lug starts to protrude from the, from the watch and where the other side of the watch is, or whether it's ignoring the crown and crown guard across the bezel. So until we actually have a direct measurement, it's very difficult to know what that actually means. But certainly it seems at this point that the sizing has remained essentially the same, given that the previous Submariner had much wider lugs, and also, through a trick of, of proportions, the new version has, to, has a 21mm lug width rather than 20mm, to further adapt the proportions to look better as a larger case. The crown guards have grown both narrower and shorter, protecting a little bit less of the crown and adding a little bit less weight to the side of the watch, which I think is a good choice, given that the vast majority of people don't ever need the crown guards to protect the crown of their watch. But then there are far more subtle elements to this timepiece. If you look at the hands, for example, they've changed quite considerably. Because whilst Mercedes hands are an icon of the Rolex collection, they're very different between models. The shape of the hands on, for instance, the Submariner and the GMT Master II is very different. If you look at the GMT Master II, particularly the most recent version, it has nice large hands, especially the Mercedes hand, which are nice and wide, but relatively short tipped. The Submariner, on the other hand, until this latest generation, had a much narrower hour hand and a slightly longer one. With this new watch, they've kept the pointed end of it, but they've widened and enlarged the hand along with a lengthened minute hand, which means that the hands just fit the dial a little bit better. This is also the case with the second hand, which has grown in both directions, tip and counterweight. There is, of course, also a revised Swiss-made logo 
at the bottom of the dial, but ultimately this watch maintains the same look as the previous Submariner. This really is no revolution, and nothing like the change which people experienced from the final generation of, of Submariner with an aluminium bezel through to ceramic Submariners, which feel extremely different on the wrist. With this watch, on the other hand, I think that unless you were someone who had worn the previous Submariner regularly, it would be unlikely that you could tell the difference having worn each a single time, perhaps trying it on an authorised dealer. These are fundamentally evolutions of the previous generation across the range, but they're clearly refined, and they're clearly refined towards people's tastes, which I think is most interesting about this watch. Previously, Rolex has been very direct about the way it sees its watches. It designs watches, and people tend to enjoy them. Now, their design is the product of generations of work to make them as comfortable as possible. It's very much the case that the Oyster case from Rolex is about as comfortable as you can get, of course in the correct size for your wrist, but it is a fantastic design for comfort. And the Submariner, with its wider lugs in the previous generation, always had this slight weight over its head, which was that many people still preferred the narrower lugs of the previous generation, and there were rather few advocates of the wider lugs who didn't simply want the newer version for the technical advantages which it held. So what can we actually learn about Rolex from this watch? Well, certainly what is clear is that the green Submariner is here to stay, and isn't a production run which will suddenly end. Many people thought this with the previous generation's Hulk green Submariner. That this was simply going to be produced for a period, and then discontinued before the black Submariner of that variety was discontinued and replaced. That wasn't the case in the end. And so we now know that the green Submariner, or a green bezeled Submariner, as is the case with the new collection, is going to be an integral part of the set. We also know that Rolex is standardising its new movements across the range. It's added the 3230 and 3235 movements, as seen in different forms in the Seedweller range, into these watches, and so it's fairly clear that these movements are here to stay and are going to be part of the Submariner collection and the whole of the Rolex range. And these have a lot of very impressive technology in them, like the Chronogy Escapement, which is lighter and reduces friction, which is a very helpful function to also increase the power reserve. But I think that if you step away from the press blurb which you'll receive if you go onto the Rolex website, there is something more interesting to see about this watch, which tells you a lot about how Rolex understands its customers, and in a way which I don't think they've ever done in the past. And this is what I particularly want to address here, now having spoken about the range itself. But now for a word from the sponsor of this podcast, Arage, a brand which started with its own movement and created a brand around it. After three generations, their K1 automatic movement offers a groundbreaking silicon escapement, 65-hour power reserve, and the reliability of a truly tested movement. By taking an industrial approach to movement design, Arage have created a movement capable of widespread production, with an unprecedented efficiency of production too. The result is a movement which not only offers modern componentry, but also a modern design in a world of movements finding their roots in the 20th century. Modular by design, this movement additionally offers a large date, small seconds and power reserve built into the architecture, thus avoiding the addition of cumbersome modules. Despite its feature set, K1 fits into smaller cases and retains a slender form factor. In truth, this is the movement which I see as a real contender for the best of the current flock of luxury automatic movements. To learn more about Arage and K1, head over to arage.com. But returning to the theme of the video, the aspect which I think is most important here is to ask what this shows about Rolex and how they've worked over the last few years. You see, previously the Submariner has improved with every generation, and that's clearly true with the newest one with the new movements and with a better shape to fit wrists. But it also shows that Rolex have taken a very different approach to what they've done in the past to demand. In the past, Rolex have dictated what the market wants. That was their role, they led the market, and they still do lead the market to a very great extent. The Submariner is the definitive dive watch. Okay, it doesn't have the water resistance of, let's say, the Sea Dweller, but it's all the dive watch you might ever need, except for the most particular and specific of applications. But over the last few years, it seems that the Hans Wilsdorf Foundation, the owner of Tudor and Rolex, has had an awful lot more to think about in terms of trying the market and understanding what it is people actually want. You see, at the moment there are immense queues outside Rolex shops to buy watches, and this is understandable given the fact that their marketing has worked extremely well, and the fact that there's been a revived interest in watches, and as a result Rolex, in the last few years. 
But there is another side, which is that they've been able to understand what people want, where ergonomics are concerned, where the key themes are concerned amongst people wanting watches, particularly with Tudor, which has been, it seems, an extremely good tool to understand what the market wants, and also to be able to understand the heritage which people want to see in a watch, because that's a side which the Submariner never really appealed to, and which Rolex is very careful to avoid. Rolex certainly seems to not want to be a heritage or vintage brand in any way. The Submariner must look forward, whilst the Tudor Black Bay will always be a retrospective product celebrating the best of the past. But the slightly peculiar result of this is that with the latest Submariner, you don't get the sense that Rolex is pushing the edge of the envelope. It's no longer pushing the boundaries of what a dive watch should be. With the ceramic Submariner, it directed brands to add ceramic bezels to their watches. It was no longer acceptable to have a luxury watch with an aluminium bezel. It just couldn't be done anymore. Now, we all see ceramic bezels everywhere. But the new Submariner is very different. This has a 41mm case, yes, but also a case which ergonomically is much more of the norm than the previous generation with its wider lugs and wider crown guards. It also moves towards the industry-recognised 70-hour power reserve, but it doesn't add in the way of new technology to amaze or surprise. This is very much designed to be the definitive dive watch, but not one which suggests what the future might hold. To make matters even more peculiar, it seems that the new Submariner has been informed in its creation through the use of far less popular watches, the Sea Dweller and the Sea Dweller Deep Sea. These watches released over the last few years, the Sea Dweller with the red text on the dial at 43mm in 2017, and 2018, the following version of the Deep Sea, we saw changes to the cases which I think form the backbone of what the new Submariner is. Notably, these watches increased in size. In the case of the standard Sea Dweller, it grew from 40 to 43 millimeters, and in the case of the Deep Sea, it remained at 44 millimeters, but actually wore its size better by widening the lug aperture from 21 to 22 millimeters, and was able to therefore be a more popular and more wearable watch. And through these two watches, Rolex was able to understand, firstly, of course, that the narrow lugs of those watches were attractive, but also that the proportions were simply better on these watches with larger cases on paper, but with a better designed format to fit the wrist. Of course, aside from that, it was able to also test the reliability of its new movements with those watches, which is something which initially was a problem for, for example, Tudor with their GMT movement, which simply didn't work in the first few months. And there were a lot of watches recalled and uh, repaired under warranty as a result of these problems. And so with the Submariner, you get the sense that this is a very pragmatic release. It's not something which is going to push the industry forward, unlike previous versions, but something which instead shows a fantastic understanding of what people want. And I think that's very, very different to what we've seen from Rolex in the past, and I think it marks a real change in their brand philosophy. I don't think this means that Rolex will in any way change their position from being at the top of the industry, but it does show that they have a very different attitude these days to the consumer, something which I think a lot of people would be surprised to know. But what do you think about these speculations about how Rolex looks at the industry and how it looks at its own watches in terms of learning how to produce the best watch? I think it's rather interesting to see this release, and I'm certainly not in any way negative towards these watches. They're not for me, but I certainly respect what's been done here. If you enjoyed this podcast, do remember to follow us on whichever platform you've been listening to it, and also follow us on Instagram to catch all the latest photos and also releases from the industry in article form, podcast form, or of course video form. But thank you very much for watching and listening. This is Armon from watchchronicle.com. Out.